Welcome, I'm Anthony Ramos, Senior Accountant at Meetup. This is the 13th installment in our Dismantling Social Just Injustice series of Meetup Live events. You may have joined us for previous events in the series where we've covered issues such as mental health, urban policy, and equal and civil rights for the transgender community. And if so, welcome back. And if this is your first time with us, welcome and thanks for joining this conversation. Our goal is to continue fostering important dialogue through events just like these. And in today's installment, we're honoring National Hispanic Heritage Month with special guest, Elaine Montilla, founder of 5X Minority. She's here to join, to share her journey of coming to the United States from her home country of the Dominican Republic. You'll get firsthand insight of what the American dream looks like for Hispanic and Latino Latinx, as well as some of the challenges she faced, how she overcame them and supported her community. At the end, stick around for some Q&A as well. <clears throat> and before we get started, I'd like to go over our event guidelines and agenda for this event. So for the event guidelines, this event will be recorded. You will not, however, you will not appear in any of the video. The video will be off for all the attendees. Um, it will also be, the audio will also be muted during the event. However, if you do have any questions, you can submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, closed captioning is available to turn on. Click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of your screen and select the preference. And to go through our agenda on the next slide, we'll start off with a quick five minute introduction um, and then jump into our discussion with Elaine and end it off with a Q&A um, session for 15 minutes and you can ask, ask your questions at the bottom of the screen. All right. And before we jump into our discussion, I'd like to give a brief intro to our panelists, Elaine Montilla. Elaine Montilla is the founder of 5xminority.com, a company and social media brand dedicated to empowering women and minorities, especially in tech, with a mission to demonstrate how businesses can be powerful platforms for social change. She's also a TEDx speaker, a Forbes Technology Council member and contributor, and currently serves as the asset assistant vice president and CIO for IT and Graduate Center CUNY. Okay, bye, Elaine. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. Hey, Anthony. Happy to be here. And I'm so excited to read all the places people are from. Dubai, California. I love it. Thank you for joining us. You have some great lists to attend you, definitely. All right, so let's begin our discussion. We'll start a discussion, a few questions. So, Elaine, I guess we start out. Tell us about your story migrating to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic. Um, how old were you and why did you decide to come? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic, and I did not move to the U.S. until I was 17 years old, right after finishing high school. Um, I can tell you that it was not my decision to, to move to the U.S. It was my mom's decision, and it took me years to understand that it was the right decision that she made. I was not happy at the beginning. Uh, but I can tell you that my mom is very big in education and she knew that in order for us to have a better future and a better education, we needed to leave, unfortunately, the Dominican Republic. And so she decided to uh, take a big risk and come to the U.S. You know how back at home people talk about the dream of going into the U.S., the dream of being in New York. And so she wanted to give us a better future. And that's, that's how I ended up being here at a, at a not so early age, actually, because I was already finishing high school when I came to New York. Yeah, so you said you arrived in New York when you were 17. I guess, what was it like when you first arrived in New York? Uh, it was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I hated it. My first few days here, I did not want to be here. I, you know, I graduated high school, let's say on a Friday. Saturday, my mom had me in a plane already coming to New York. And so I am sure you probably know this. It's a very different life. I had a lot of friends. Um, I have my family, my cousins back at home. And when I came to New York, it was, it was the winter time. And so I was not used to wearing a coat. I was not used to wearing many layers in order to leave my house. Um, my beautiful island is pretty warm. And so all I needed was shorts and I was ready to go. 
And so it was a big shift for me. I, I never saw snow. And so I was shocked to see how cold it was here, how different it was here. Even the shoes that I needed to wear to go outside. Um, I really miss my friends a lot, the most. I think that was the biggest thing. I miss my friends because my mom was here, my sister was here. So um, I think it was more just having a group of people that understand you, uh, speak your language and know where you're coming from. Mind you, when I came here, I didn't speak English either. And so it was a big challenge for me to, to have to learn a new language, to get a new identity. People didn't know how to say my name in Spanish. And so instead of Elaine, people started calling me Elaine, which took me a while to get used to. It felt like I was getting a new identity and I had to respond to people who were calling me by, by this new name. So I, I really, I wanted to go back home. I would cry to my mom and say, can you send me back, please? I wanna go back. I wanna be, I wanna be with my friends. I don't wanna be here. Um, so it was a shock, definitely, at the beginning. And I'm sure some of the people in the audience can relate to that. You know, you miss your family, you miss your friends, you miss your culture, your food, your music. I missed everything. Yeah, definitely. As, as you said, it was a big shift. So, um, I mean, what were some of the challenges you faced with that move? And did you notice some people around you were facing similar challenges? How did you uh, overcome them? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me go piece by piece. <laughs> so <laughs> challenges, I would say the first one was not speaking the language, you know, just knowing that I wanted to say things, but I didn't know how to express that. I didn't know how to say them. Um, and so the challenge was just making sure that I found ways to communicate with people around me who were not speaking the same language. Now, I would say I was really lucky because when I came to New York, the college that I went to is, is called Hostess Community College. And most of the students are Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Colombians. Um, so I got a lot of help from my peers while I was going to classes. I remember going to class and telling myself, I don't know what the professor just said right now. I have no idea. And they would tell me, oh, don't worry, Lane, we're going we're gonna to get through this together. Um, so I would say the language was the first thing. Um, then when I started working in tech, um, my accent, so here's the, the second level of that. Once you learn English, you still have an accent. And I remember feeling shame because I had an accent. Uh, and I think a lot of, uh, Hispanics can relate to that. We have this need to belong and be part of a group. And so I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. I felt like I was alone. Um, and so I was ashamed of having an accent. Uh, and then, so you asked me how I overcame that. And I can tell you that one of the ways I did was making fun of myself. I actually used humor because I was tired of people making comments when I couldn't pronounce a word. So I started making fun of myself. I started joking. And every time I mispronounced something, I would say, well, you know, it's not every day that you find people that can speak more than one language. And I would laugh. And people would laugh. And I think that was one of the things that helped me the most, just knowing that, you know, I'm not perfect and I will never be. Nobody around me is perfect either. It took me a while to understand that because when you move to the U.S. and you see, you know, white people who are wearing a suit and are sitting at a meeting, you think they're perfect. You think they got it all together. And the reality is that they don't. They're as insecure, if not more, as you are. But you don't know that when you first come here. And so it took me a while to understand that. And then going into tech, which is a male dominated workspace, um, I was usually the only woman. I'm still today. Uh, but I remember going to C++ class and just being one of two women in the class taking programming classes. And so it was intimidating at the beginning to be surrounded by all these men. And, and sometimes you have the doubt of, ah, am I good enough? Am I gonna be good at this? Why did I do this? Um, so I went through some of that. And in the workplace then it's the same thing because most of the people who are working in tech are men. Most of the meetings that I go to, I'm surrounded by men. Uh, but after a while you get used to it and you learn how to use it as an advantage instead. I hope I answer all your questions. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, how did you um, overcome some of those challenges that you um, mentioned? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things for me is making sure that I surround myself with 
supportive people, right? And I think sometimes, let me share this with you. Sometimes we get a lot of pressure from our own people. And I remember when I started to learn English and I decided to go to college, I had a lot of friends telling me, you know, why are you studying so much? We got to go to the club this weekend. Why are you always doing this? And so it took me a minute to understand that I needed to move away from that. And you feel really guilty at the beginning because these are your people. You don't want to be away from them. But then at the same time, I knew the future that I wanted for myself, right? And so I had to make a decision and say, I'm going to surround myself with people who are elevating me, right? And so I do that for other people today. Um, so making sure that people are rooting for you, challenging you, uh, and wanting the best for you. And then the second one was my education. I can tell you that I had a very strong accent. I'm a female. I would walk into rooms where people would look at me and on top of that, think that I'm too young to be a supervisor, to be a manager, to be a CIO, even today. I decided that my education was the one thing that nobody can take away from me. And I see it as a passport that allow me to go to all these other places. And so as soon as I came, I got my associate degree. I needed to make money. So I got a technical degree in IT. Then I got my bachelor's degree. Then I got my master's degree. And in between, I got a whole bunch of IT certifications because I knew that if you look at my resume and you see my credentials, you can't just put me to the side and say, well, you know, she's Latina. She doesn't know what she's doing. And so I, I saw that as the, an opportunity to help me get into the door in many places where I don't think I would be able to get in if I didn't have the credentials that I, that I had. Yeah, see, uh, do you believe you're still facing some of these challenges today? Yeah, I think that this is not something that's gonna go away that easily. And especially in tech, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that 40% of women leave tech after 10 years and they leave because of the lack of support and mentorship. And so what happens now is that companies are focusing a lot of their attention on the hiring process and making sure that we have one of each. And so I have a Latina, that's a check mark, I'm good to go. I have a black person, that's it, I'm, a, I'm good to go, it's a check mark. But what they don't understand is that after you're hired, that's when the work begins, right? You need to be paired with someone who's a senior at the company so that they can show you how to do your work, share the company culture, which you need to learn. Uh, it's good to have mentors and sponsors and people who are helping you. The annual reviews, in my opinion, shouldn't be annual. They should happen constantly. You shouldn't have to wait a year for your supervisor to tell you how good you're doing. And so... Uh, I'm still going through that. I can I can share a story with you that happened not so long ago. I've, I've sure. been in rooms where, you know, a vendor, for example, would come in and they would speak to the man in the room thinking that he's the CIO and not me. Uh, and so it takes it takes a while for people to get rid of some of, you know, what we call unconscious bias, which we all have, including me. I know I have it. Um, it's all the years of conditioning, you know, it's all the years of, for example, Anthony, watching TV shows where you don't see yourself represented, right? Watching commercials where something is highlighted, right? Like you didn't see a lot of women in STEM until recently, right? Because it was, a, it was something that men would usually do. And so I think there is change happening, but I think it's very slow. We need to do better. Yes, I agree. Um, I'm sure some people are still facing the same challenges you face. Is there anything you can tell them to help them overcome them or what we can do to minimize or eradicate them? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the first thing that I would say is make sure you educate yourself. Um, I think sometimes we're waiting for someone to save us. We're waiting for someone to tell us what to do. And it was very important for me to understand what was happening around me. And so take the time to educate yourself, know your rights. There are so many things that happen in the workplace where I didn't know that I had rights. I didn't know that I can go to HR. I didn't know that I can speak to someone about it. And I think sometimes that is a disadvantage. Um, something else that I notice is that, especially for, for Latinos, Sometimes, especially for women, 
sometimes we don't know how to self-promote because we feel like we're showing off, right? And so your family always tells you, you know, be quiet, sit down, uh, calladita te, te ves más bonita, right? That's what they tell girls usually. And so we don't know how to promote ourselves. And that is a big problem. One of the things that I learned is that if you're sharing information that's based on facts, you're not, you're not showing off. You're sharing how freaking smart you are. And so I do that a lot. I look at myself in the mirror and I tell myself how amazing I am. <laughs> and after you do that a few times, you don't feel weird anymore. Um, the other thing that I, would, that I would recommend is something that I call collect evidence. So I don't know if you ever dealt with this, Anthony, but a lot of us deal with something called imposter syndrome. And it's this notion where you feel like somebody at some point is going to find out that you're not as good as they think you are. Like this, something is wrong with me. I don't think I could do this. And one day somebody's going to find out. And so what I did is I started this document. It's in the cloud. I have it in my Dropbox. And I write down all of my accomplishments with the month, with the year, with the date. Every single thing that I accomplish is in that document. I've had that document for probably 10 years now. And I would recommend anyone listening to me right now to start that document. And let me tell you how this could help you. If you have an annual review with your boss, you need that document because you're gonna bring that with you and that's how you're gonna show them all the work you've been doing, right? If you feel like imposter syndrome is coming and you're doubting yourself, you go to that document and you read it and you remind yourself of all the things that you have accomplished. And so it, it has saved me in many occasions because imposter syndrome doesn't go away forever. Sometimes it likes to come back and, and, and start to pick in. Um, and so I think, you know, collecting evidence, learning how to promote yourself. If you have a meeting, try to find ways to share the projects you've completed. Share how good you are. Nobody's going to do it for you. I know you probably heard of the elevator pitch, Make sure you have an elevator pitch because you never know when you're going to be in the elevator with the head of the department or the, C, the CEO or somebody who is a publisher and maybe you want to write a book. You want to make sure you can explain in a sentence or two what you do and how good you are and where you're planning to go, right? Um, and then the last thing I would share is make sure you have an updated LinkedIn account. A few years ago, I could tell you that nobody was going to LinkedIn. It was not a big deal. Today, it's a huge deal. Companies are there. You can create a lot of connections there. Networking is huge. And so every time you change jobs, if you do something, go to LinkedIn, update it, uh, follow people that are doing what you want to do, kind of like role models for you, share comments on, on, on the things that, that they write about. Um, and all of that combined with networking, it's really going to push you forward. Okay. Where did you learn all these strategies? I guess, like, did you, um, have a mentor that helped you as well, or is just something you, I guess, came up with as you facing these challenges? Yeah. Yeah. I learned in many different ways. So one of them is through reading. I love reading. I read a lot of books every year. Um, I try to switch between a spiritual book and a business book because I'm a very spiritual person. And so I think I have a balance there where I understand that I need to have space to react, to respond to the things that happen around me. But I also want to stay up to date with the business side of things and technology. So I read a lot of books. And just so you know, the authors of these books, they don't know it, but they're my mentors also. They don't know it, but they are. Um, I was also very lucky that I found a few mentors. And so I got a lot of help from people who would see me things that I didn't see myself. And so I remember one of my mentors just telling me, sit down, let's talk about this. Let me go over what you just did right now. And, and it was something wrong that I did. And, and I will never forget that, you know, if you allow yourself um, for others to guide you and mentor you, because that's the other thing, it's not only find a mentor, but are you a good mentee? Can you be a mentee? Can you take criti uh, uh, constructive criticism, right? Because if you cannot, then, then the mentorship is not going to work. But something else I want to mention is that networking has, networking has helped a lot. I am part of a lot of Slack groups where I communicate with a lot of people. 
uh, on LinkedIn. I also communicate with a lot of people and you just have to be open-minded and know that you're not the smartest person in the room, right? Every room that I go into, I know I have something to learn from someone in there, right? And so if you consider yourself a student for life, you will always be growing and looking for things. So I, I listen to podcasts. I know it sounds like a lot. I don't do all of this at the same time, I promise you. <laughs> but I have a few podcasts that I listen to every once in a while, uh, combined with book reading, mentors, and doing research. I read a lot. I go online and I do research about things that matter to me. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those tips. Do um, you have any other tips? Yeah. I guess if you're not on LinkedIn, any other resources you can recommend outside of LinkedIn as well, as you mentioned? Well, if you're on Slack, um, there are a few groups that I love. Uh, the first one is Tequeria. I don't know if you heard of Tequeria before. But they are amazing. I love them. If you're looking for work or advice, there is a, a Slack group for a company called Tribaja. It's T-R-I-B-A-J-A. -A. Uh, they are really good at bringing companies and setting up events so that you can meet with them. Uh, if you are in tech and you're a woman, uh, make sure you check out uh, the Grace Hopper conference. It's actually coming up next week and I'm attending. So I hope to see you there if you go. So it's the Grace Hopper conference. It's amazing. It's one of the biggest conference in tech. Um, and I also love, well, I have so many groups. There is a group called Out in Tech. If you're a member of the LGBTQ community like me, um, they are really good. They have gatherings. You can meet a lot of people there. Uh, and Latinas in Tech is another group that I belong to. And you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time there. I go once a day, I look at the groups, I look at the channels, I share information, I read what's there, and then I come out. But you know, even, even speaking engagements sometimes come through some of these different groups. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing those tips and some of those groups for sure. Um, I know in the beginning of the conversation, in the discussion, you mentioned the American dream. Um, mm. What did you think the American dream was when you... Um, was originally moving to the U.S. and did the reality live up to what you expected or I guess how did it mm. appear overall? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I can tell you that for me, growing up in the Dominican Republic, when people talked about the American dream, it sounded very dreamy. It sounded very nice. Uh, I would hear people say, oh my God, if you go to New York and you go through the garbage, they're throwing new things away. You could find new things on the street. And, and so there's all these stories that you hear before you come. And let me tell you, it's nothing like that. Okay. It's nothing like that. It was a rude awakening for me. Um, especially, I don't know. I mean, I think as a woman, we tend to be more, more vulnerable. Um, but I, I faced a lot of uh, discrimination. I, 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 I would have people stare at my lips because they wanted to make sure they understood the words that were coming out of my mouth. So having an accent, coming here, and, and, and the way people look at you sometimes makes you feel worse about yourself, right? And so I, I don't think it was similar to the picture that people were painting. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, if you go to the US and you work really hard, you're gonna get ahead. That is not always the truth. It's not. Um, I know a lot of people that work really hard and are in the same position for 10 years, right? And so I think that sometimes it's who you know, sometimes it's, I'm gonna go back to networking over and over again, because I don't think People understand how important it is to network. I have people that I met my first year doing my associate degree in college that I'm doing business with today, years later, right? You never know where you're gonna end up. So it's good to connect with as many people as you can, positive people who are going to elevate you. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was not, the same. I, I miss everything about being back home and the treatment that we get. Um, you know, it's not something that you are expecting, especially if you're not an adult when you come here. Um, you don't think about this stuff and nobody tells you. And it's good that nobody tells you because 
maybe you would never come if someone tells you. Um, I'm not saying that that is the case for everyone. I want to make that clear. A lot of people don't go through any of the things that I mentioned, and that's amazing. But a lot of my friends, a lot of people that I know, you know, it's really hard for them because um, I know they get discriminated just because of their last name, you know? Even when you submit your resume, I don't know if it ever happened to you, Anthony, but even when you submit your resume, people look at Anthony Ramos and they automatically make assumptions about you without knowing who you are because your last name is Ramos, right? And so we are at disadvantage in many ways and sometimes we don't even see it. I didn't see a lot of these things on, until I made it to a management role because I couldn't see it before. And so it's, uh, it's different, but anything is possible. And if you're watching me, then you know that whatever dreams you have, whatever aspirations you have, it's possible because if I'm a CIO and I came here when I was 17, uh, you could also be a CIO. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, as we continue the discussion, you mentioned as well the cultural differences. Um, because what are mm. some of like, the cultural differences um, between the Dominican culture and American culture? I'm sure they're very different. Um, mm. you, was there a clash between the two cultures also? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of, um, I'm going to call it own learning on my end, <laughs> especially if you want to move up in your company. Now, I can tell you that this is not fair. This is not the way things should be. This is how they are, right? And sometimes you need to learn how to play the game if you want to make it to the top. So one example I could give you is that we're very loud. Dominicans are very loud. I had to learn how to lower my voice <laughs> so that when I go into a meeting, people don't freak out when I open my mouth. <laughs> And so it took me a while, even the way I laugh, I can tell you back in the Dominican Republic, I laugh and my mouth would open from here to the ceiling because that's the way I laugh. I have so much joy inside of me. I still do, but I had to change that a little bit um, because I knew what my goal is. You know, I, if you have a goal, there are little things that you can compromise on, right? So I would not compromise on my authenticity, being Elaine, being who I am. I would not do that. But there are other things that you have to, unfortunately, today, if you want to make it to the top. So I, I want this to be a very honest conversation because I know if you're here, it's because you want to hear the truth, right? Um, and so uh, I had to learn how to, you know, this thing called emotional intelligence where I would walk into a room and learn how to read the room. I'm very good at that now. It took me years. And so I know by sitting with you and looking at you, I know how you feel about the things that I'm doing. Uh, this is another thing that I did a lot before. I use my hands a lot. I mean, big, everywhere, hands. I speak with my hands. I had to learn how to not do that so much, right? Um, and then, you know, my music, I miss my music. Uh, I'm very lucky that I came to New York. I also want to acknowledge that other people that come to other states that are less diverse, it's probably worse for them than for me. All I needed to do is go to Washington Heights. <laughs> And that's it. My people are there. I have music, I have food, I have everything. Uh, but working, uh, especially when I was working in corporate, I, I, it was hard for me to adjust and know that the plantain that I normally eat for breakfast is not something that I could do when I go to the workplace. I cannot bring onions and plantain and eggs, right? I need to bring oatmeal or cereal. <laughs> And so it took some time to adjust to that. Um, but I think that you pick and choose. And sometimes it really depends on what your personal goal is. Um, what worked for me may not work for you. So even while you're listening to me today, take the things that resonate with you and leave the rest, right? Because I had a lot of role models that would do things that I would not follow because I know where I want to go. And so I'm not going to have 20 versions of myself, which I did when I first came here, because we all want to fit in and we want to belong and we want to be friends with everyone. Uh, it took me years, but now I learned that there is only one version of Elaine and you get her everywhere you meet her because I'm not willing to not be myself to please you anymore. But it takes, it takes courage and it takes years for you to, to get to that position. 
And um, I know you're the obviously the founder of 5X Minority and also the CAO from IIT, the Graduate Center at CUNY. But um, as the founder of 5X Minority, can you also tell us more about it and um, what inspired you actually to start it up as well? Yeah, yeah, that's my baby, actually, 5X Minority. <laughs> um, it actually it's funny because if you ask me about my role as a CIO, I mean, I work really hard for it and I love it. Uh, but my passion is doing the work for 5X Minority. So. It started as a blog years ago. I, I like writing and I, was, I came to a point where I was telling myself, how can I share what I know with other women who want to be in tech or minorities or anyone for that matter? I don't discriminate. And so I was thinking, how can I share all these things that I've learned? How can I use my voice so that I can help my community? And so the idea of a blog came up and I was like, well, I'll put it here. Here's a website. I can buy the domain and just start writing. And so what happened a few years ago is that I was blessed to do a TEDx talk and everything changed after the tech talk. People started calling me. I started getting emails left and right. And a lot of them were really touching. I mean, I cried a lot because I would get emails from girls who would tell me, Elaine, I love your talk. I feel like I'm not alone. I feel like I'm not the only one going through these issues. And so that's when I decided, okay, I need to do more than just writing on this blog, right? So I founded 5X Minority as a company officially, and I focus on doing a lot of public speaking panels, moderation, and I go to companies privately to do talks with the staff. Uh, workshops. Uh, and so that that fills me up. I am very vocal. You have to actually tell me to shut up. Uh, and if you follow me in any social media at 5 you will see that I am very passionate about diversity and inclusion and making sure that our voices are heard. And so anything that I could find to elevate each of you, I will do that. And I couldn't do that if I didn't work hard to be at this level because people would not listen to me. So one of the things that I told myself is you need, you need to be at this level because that's the only place where you would be allowed to bring about change, right? So I'm the boss now. I could bring change. If I was a technician, I wouldn't be able to. And so I feel now that is kind of a responsibility for me to look back and, and help my community. And so I, I, it brings me with, it, bring, it fills me with joy to do the work for 5X Minority. Thanks for sharing that. Um, obviously, you built a great platform to have our voices heard, and um, the platform is definitely used for everyone joining. But I guess, um, what can we also be doing to help other immigrants in our community overall? Mm. Yeah, you know, something that I don't think we talk about enough is the fact that sometimes we see each other as competition, um, especially women. Uh, I've seen that a lot where other Latinas feel like I'm competition to them. And so the first thing that I would say is let's, let's be one, especially now that we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month, we need to unite. I mean, we're not gonna, we're not gonna change things if we are separate, right? And so be compassionate towards other people and understand that there is abundance, right? These things normally happen when you have a scarcity mindset where you think, well, if I'm female and I got this job, I cannot have another female Latina here because then there's gonna be less for me. That is not how it works. There is more than enough for everyone. And so I think the first thing is, is understanding that we need to support each other. And like I said earlier, once you make it to a level where you can give back, you have to start giving back. It is a responsibility. You have to give back because other people are relying on you to do that. You have to use your voice because a lot of them are invisible. People cannot see them. But if they see you, you have to use your voice now. And so uh, at, at the end of my talk, one of the things that I said is, you know, look around the room and find someone who looks nothing like you, right? and give them your wisdom, talk to them, share your knowledge. And I don't think we share enough. I think sometimes we, we're hoarders, like we're hoarding the knowledge that we have um, and we don't want anybody else to have it because then it will be less for me. Uh, everything I know, I will share. I mean, 
I don't need it. What am I going to do with it? There is no point. And if I can make sure that 20 other women become CIO, then why not? The more, the better. Um, and so I think we have to change that mentality a little bit. And also, you know, we have to shop, uh, you know, small business owned by Latinos. We need to help our community. We have to help each other. I think sometimes, you know, our eyes get bigger when we see big brands and we see all these brand names that in the end mean nothing, you know? So I think we should focus on being authentic, not losing who we are, not trying to please other people or become something other than we are, uh, and, and, and then reach back later on and then bring other people up with you. Awesome, thanks for sharing that. And um, as you, you mentioned in the, um, the previous, you also mentioned um, some of the networking groups. Can you please um, mention those over again? I have some yeah. questions for that actually. Yeah, that. yeah, definitely. I'm gonna open my phone because I don't wanna forget any of them. Sure, no and problem. I wanna make sure I give you that information. So here we go. The first one I want to mention is, oh, I forgot to mention this one. They're switching from Slack where you can connect with them. It's called Ladies Get Paid. Okay, some of them are only for women. <laughs> I'm sorry. So Ladies Get Paid is one of them. The next one is Latinas in Tech. They're huge. They have a lot of free events. Um, I think there was one last week about asking for a raise and, you know, being comfortable asking for a raise. It's amazing how much you learn by going to this free event. So Latinas in Tech, Out in Tech for my LGBTQ communities, Out in Tech. Tequeria, I mentioned that one earlier, is T-E-C-H-Q-U-E-R-I-A, -E Tequeria. If you're looking for work, Tribaja is T-R-I-B-A-J-A. -A. If you're a woman in tech, there is a, a pretty cool, huge Slack group called Women in Tech, Women in Tech. And I have another group that I belong to is called Women in Tech Caribbean. So it's, it's, it's for all the ladies from the Caribbean and they have a lot of cool events also. I hope that's those. helpful. I'm sure it definitely will be. Um, so after jumping into q and I have a few more questions coming in as well. Um, okay. One of the questions I have here is, um, what is most helpful to hear from allies? Uh, what do you wish you never heard again? From Say that again, allies? Anthony. So one of the questions I have is, what is the most helpful thing you heard from allies? And what do you wish you never heard again? Mm, okay, perfect. Thank you. Things that I heard from an ally. Well, the best thing I hear is I have your back. I've got your back. You can count on me. Let me share a tip with you. If you are uncomfortable going into a meeting, right? And you feel like people are not listening to you and they don't let you speak. I want you to pair up with another person and tell them, right? You're going to plan all of this in advance. If I get interrupted, I want you to come in and have my back. And if you get interrupted, I'm going to have your back. And so I want you to use that strategy moving forward because I needed to use that strategy and I didn't know about it until later, right? And so if somebody says uh, something in the middle of your conversation, this other person would say, I'm sorry, I really want to hear what Elaine has to say. Elaine, can you finish? It, it would be really helpful for you to do that. Um, something that I heard that I don't want to hear again. <laughs> I got to think about that one. Oh, maybe if someone said, this is not a place for you. This is, you don't belong here. This is not the place for you. And they will never say that with words. They will say with their actions, right? They will never say with words. Or some people would say with words, which is crazy in my opinion, but it's subtle sometimes, you know, sometimes they don't use words. They, they let you know that you don't belong or they don't want you there. And so I keep mentioning courage because it really takes a lot of courage to say, you know what? No, I have a voice. I belong here and I'm staying. And that's what I want you to do. Yeah. Um, were you ever told that, I guess, like in a professional setting or was it when you first moved in school, like you don't belong here? Oh yeah, I was told that many times without words, right? Without words. Yeah. I, I remember 
I remember not being invited to things because they didn't think I needed to be there. I remember being cut off in a meeting because I was taking too long to give my answer. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of examples like that, but, and after a while, you know, you, you forget, which is good because you don't want to remember those moments, but yeah, it happens. And, and I think sometimes we just don't know how powerful we are. We don't, we just don't know it. It took me a while. And once I learned, then I was able to not need another person at a meeting, for example. Now, if someone interrupts me, I would say, Anthony, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm not done. I need a few more minutes. And I just keep talking. But it takes you a while to have the confidence to do that, right? Thanks for sharing the story. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, we have a question as, as first generation born here and someone who was shipped back and forth to Mexico at a young age, I had an identity crisis. After mm -hmm. the constant discrimination as a young child and woman, I still now have a chip on my shoulder. How do you stop that from deterring you or from hindering you? Oh, I love that question. The answer is compassion. The answer is compassion. Um, and not only compassion for others, but self-compassion, right? I think sometimes we're very hard on ourselves, especially if you are a driven woman and you really know that you have potential to do a lot. Sometimes we want to be perfect. And if you go to my, if you go to 5X Minority, you will see an article that I wrote about uh, being, being a perfectionist. I call myself a recovering perfectionist because it doesn't really go away, but I'm recovering from it. And I, I wanted everything to be perfect. And so what I learned now is that just like people who want revenge, um, you know, we don't forgive people because we want to let, you know, let them off the hook. We forgive them because we we need peace, right? We forgive because of ourselves. It's not for other people. And so when you bring compassion into the picture and you understand that people only know this much, so they behave with what they know, they don't know any better. You understand that sometimes it's not their fault. You know, there is a lot of conditioned thinking that we grow up with and sometimes we don't know how to get rid of it, right? And so we keep repeating what we heard growing up. And it takes a while to get rid of that. Um, something that I learned recently is that instead of telling someone what is wrong with you, I tell myself and I wonder what happened to you, right? And so when you bring compassion and instead of blaming, you actually try to step back and try to understand what did they go through that made them that way, right? So when, when someone is being nasty, I'm always thinking to myself, what happened growing up? What, what made you this way, right? And that's why my spiritual side saved me <laughs> because I have a lot of compassion for everyone, even the people who would put me down. I have compassion for them because there is a reason why they do it, right? There was something lacking in their childhood that made them grow up and be this way. It takes a lot of time and courage to be this way, but it is possible. And in the end, it would help you and I'm really worried about my well-being. And I want to make sure that I have a positive energy and positive people around me all the time. And so I try not to hold on to all these negative things. I, I, I would rather be much happier remembering all the good things that are happening. And so forgiveness, compassion, and, and putting yourself in other people's shoes sometimes hurts, sometimes helps. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Um, how can we tell another Spanish or minority what she's doing is out of place without offending the person? Mm, good question. Thank you. I'm going to bring compassion again. <laughs> I use that for everything. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite books I'm going to share with you, it's called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's called The Four Agreements. Um, and one of the agreements is be impeccable with your word right? Words are very powerful, very powerful. And so I learned to be mindful and be careful with the words that I use. And so with someone like that, the first thing that I would say is, would you like to have coffee or tea with me? I want to have a conversation. And this is what I want you to bring with you. I want you to bring with you curiosity. If you are curious, and people can see that you are curious, they don't get defensive. 
because they know you're trying to learn something that you don't know, right? And so start by asking questions. Instead of saying, you know what, when you do this, this is horrible, you need to stop. Maybe ask, I noticed that you've been doing this. Where did it come from? What are you thinking when that happens? Be curious and ask questions and you will have much better results than if you just go right in. That's why emotional intelligence is so important. If any of you can ever take a class, please take it. It's called EQ, emotional intelligence. Um, uh, if you're curious and you ask questions, you're going to get so much farther than if you make assumptions. Because sometimes we make a lot of assumptions and we, we come up to people saying things that we think are right, but we don't even know what's behind it, right? So it's better to be curious and ask. And then from there, you will know what to say next, but always with compassion. Definitely. Um, I think we have the next question. Um, so in regards yes. to having a thick accent, um, what are some of the top things you did to reduce it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a, I, I, I love writing uh, poems. And so I have some poems at 5X Minority. One of them, it's called My Superpowers. And something that I learned is that, you know, all the things that I was ashamed of have become my superpowers, right? And my accent was one of them. Um, I see it now as a positive because I know I'm going back to educating yourself, right? So I learn all the benefits from being bilingual, right? And so I take pride in my accent, right? When someone says, for example, combined with humor, when someone says, oh my God, I love your accent, I would say, you mean my beautiful accent? Um, and they laugh, which is good, but I love it. I love it. Um, I spent a whole year working on self-love, right? And there, I mean, I, that, that could be another <laughs> talk, uh, but you start by writing affirmations. I don't know if you're familiar with affirmations, but you would take a notepad and you would write, Elaine, you're beautiful. I love myself. And so you have all these positive affirmations that you read every day. Um, the same with your body, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror naked and loving every part of your body was part of that. And my accent was part of that exercise where I said, you know what? Having an accent is a plus and it's my superpower because it tells you that I speak more than one language. And how many people speak more than one language at the company you work for, for example? Not that many. So it's an advantage that you have. You can think and speak and write in both languages. And that's an advantage to the company because that means you're bringing diversity to the workplace every day. You will come up with ideas that other people will not come up with. And not only that, you understand a community of people, right? Even if you're, especially if you're in sales or products, you understand a community that other people that are sitting next to you don't understand. And so I take a lot of pride in my accent and I, I don't let anyone put me down because of my accent, because I love it. But it, it took a while for me to go through that process of, I love myself so much that anyone else that loves me is on top of the love that I'm already giving myself, right? And so my accent, my, my curly hair, which is another thing that I used to worry about when I first moved here, I want a straight hair. Oh my God, you don't know how much time I spend making my hair straight because I want it to look white. Uh, and that's part of the things that we go through. Uh, so just know that you are perfect just the way you are because there's only one of you. There's only one Elaine. There's only one Anthony. Are you kidding? There is no other one. It's just one. It's just you. How amazing is that? And so just start to see it as a superpower. And, and when you believe it yourself, other people will believe it too. Definitely. Tough love, something you know, to take away. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, definitely was. <clears throat> um, I think on to the next one. Um, so around what age did you realize and came to appreciate that uh, your mom immigrated to the United States? And um, did you ever thank her? Oh my God, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I, I, I had a talk earlier today and it was for CIOs and we were, and people were asking me, you know, Elaine, you must have a lot of grit because as a woman, as a Latina and also lesbian, you probably went through so much to become a CIO. And the first thing that I would say is 
my mom went through so much for me to have what I have today, the least that I could do is make sure that she's proud, right? Um, so around one age, um, I'm going to say that it was probably my late 20s. I was really bad when I was in my early 20s. Really, really bad, really bad. Don't find pictures of me back then. Uh, and it took me a while to understand what she went through and the sacrifices that she made to make sure that I have the future that I have. I think it was in my late 20s where I started to tell her I love you every time I saw her. <laughs> Now, now she says it back to me like nothing, but it wasn't like that at the beginning. I had to learn that. And I tell her, I, I write to her. I tell her on text. My mom learned how to text people. She texts every day, all the time. And I tell her in text. And even when I did my tech talk, it was dedicated to her um, because I know that, I mean, she put herself last for us to make sure that we, that we come to the U.S., and so, yeah, it was my late 20s where I realized, wow, you, I mean, she worked in factories when she came here to the U.S. And I will never forget that. I will never forget that. I actually uh, bought her an apartment and that was one of the best days in my life. Just knowing that I would give her a key and that she didn't have to worry about a place for the rest of the years that I'm going to have her with me. And that, and that's nothing to me. I want to give her a lot more if I can, because I understand now as an adult, all the sacrifices that, and I'm not even a mom. If I was a mom, I probably understand it even better. Um, everything that she went through to make sure that we have a good future. That's great. <clears throat> uh, do you have a plan to move back to the Dominican Republic, however? N no. <laughs> no? <laughs> you know, it, let me tell you a quick story. I yeah. came to the U.S., I had an accent, right? And mm -hmm. people would always tell me, oh, you have an accent, where are you from? Years later, I went back to the Dominican Republic and I went to the Colmado, it's a grocery store. And when I went to order chips or something, the guy looked at me and said, oh, you're not from here, you have an accent. And I was like, really? <laughs> I don't belong there, I don't belong here. Um, I feel that I am a different person and my mentality is different, and I don't think I would do well if I go back home. We're very different people at this moment, and, and I don't agree with a lot of things that are happening back there, especially with the LGBTQ community, and so I don't see myself going back. Okay, thank you. Uh, as we wrap up the q and I have one last question. Um, what advice do you give to Latinx people that are proud of their queerness but have been abandoned by their family and culture because mm. of who they are? Oh, beautiful question. Thank you. Um, be patient, be patient, be patient. Let me tell you that when I first came out, my mom was devastated. She did not know what to do with herself. Um, she felt that it was her fault. And I learned that I needed to be patient and I needed to give her time to process, right? So something that, that we all need to understand is that our parents grew up in a time very different from our time, right? And I cannot expect my mom to change overnight for me, right? I just cannot do that. Maybe you want to do that. I cannot do that. And so because of the compassion that I have for others, including my mom, I had to understand that she will do it when she's ready. And in the end, it didn't take that long, thank God. But in the end, all she wanted was for me to be happy. And knowing that I was happy with the person that I was with made her understand that she was happy for me too. I also got a lot of help from my sister. I want to give a shout out to my sister. <laughs> she would be the intermediator between me and my mom. <laughs> And she really helped my mom understand that this is who I was and, uh, and this is what made me happy. But you need to be patient. You need to put yourself in their shoes. And, you know, in the end, you need to do what's best for you. I can tell you that a lot of my family members did not agree with my lifestyle and I just let them go. And I'm perfectly okay with that. 
because I only want to surround myself with people that love me and appreciate me for who I am. And if you don't, I don't need you in my life. I'm sorry. Um, that will be really difficult if it's your mom or your dad or your sibling. Um, and so I would say, be patient, give them time, ask them questions. I, I did something with my mom. I would, I would ask her a lot of questions so that she can think for herself. Instead, just like what I said with the, with the coworker, instead of telling her, you need to like me, you need to love this, I would ask her questions. So do you think this person is less than? And do you think, that, and so it made her think and I educated her about it. She educated herself too, through TV and reading. And so it took time, but um, it's not easy, it's difficult. And so we need to give people the time they need to process something that is probably new to them. Um, and in the end, you will do what's best for you. All right. Well, thanks, Aline, so much for your time and share your insights with us, your story. Thank you again so much. <clears throat> Thank you for having and, uh, me. Of course. And before we go, I'd like to share a few slides as well. Everyone. So everyone, thank you for joining. Um, you can also become a meetup organizer, find others who share your interests, start a group, and you got to save 30% on your first subscription. Just go to meetupsavings.com. And also, we have our podcast, which you can subscribe now at meetuppodcast.com. You can also subscribe via the QR code right here, where you can scan it and um, keep connected with our meetup CEO, David Siegel. Thank you, everyone out again for joining. Elaine, thank you. Thank you.